So, All right. Why don't we just launch then? You want to do a little intro? Or do you want me to just to segue right in? Um, I will. I guess I'll do a little bit of an intro. <laughs> <laughs> and we're live again for the third or fourth time. That's right. And we're live. Welcome back again to another cross-platform app development show using Corona SDK. We've been here three times today already, uh, maybe even more. Uh, this is probably the most technically challenged show we've ever had, and uh, that's all right because we're, we're having a good time and we're here. So uh, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to miss the first part of the show because it's lost forever. It was, uh, it was a one-time only show. And that's okay, though, because now we're going to get into the second half of the show, which is uh, Clone Wars. We're going, to, we're going to talk about creating minds and uh, player deaths in Clone Wars. And, um, and just to sort of briefly recap some of the things that we talked about before, we're, we're nearing the end of this session. This is, this is going to be the end of this series where we're doing the Clone Wars clone. Uh, and we're going to have the link to all that in the show notes, just as we always do. Uh, but I think we've gone, we've gone just about as far as we want to go with this series. And then we're going to start a whole brand new segment of Corona Geek around uh, mechanics. And, uh, and we'll talk more about that uh, maybe near the end of this show. So just hang out until then and we'll talk about it. But first, I want to go ahead and get right into Clone Wars before anything else happens. <laughs> we've got to be down to like at least 25 minutes or only 25 minutes left or so in our Unknown 40-minute window, so let's just yeah. hit it. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and, and, and if anybody needs to leave, uh, Sergey, I know it's late there for you, and, and Stephen, I know you've got other things, so if, you, if anybody needs to drop off, that's totally cool. All right, gentlemen, I'm going to do a – we're all recording, so I'm going to do a screen swap so that I keep the recording going, and you see what I'm doing, so let's just do this, and this one, you guys are like, I don't see anything. That's right, because I'm doing it locally. And now, share my screen, and there it is. Share. Okay, so uh, awesome. Can you see this little bar showing up? Uh, yes. Let's get that out of there. Excellent. All right, so what are we doing today? Today is the last episode where we're going to be talking about Drama True Wars Retro Evolved Clone. Unless something pops into my head in the future, <clears throat> pardon me, but we're going to talk today about mines and player death, which are related, although you would not think that they are. The reason they are related is, why don't I just go ahead and play the game a little bit, and I'll demonstrate where they're related. So we play the game, and you'll see at the top of the screen, we got three indicators showing we have three mines. And I get a few guys on the screen, and then I use one of my mines. I can remember the button for using mines. There it is. And basically what a mine does is it kills all the enemies on the screen, and if you pay attention to the score counter, it gives me points for destroying them. So I use a mine, all the enemies are dead, I'm safe for a moment, and I get points. Now, the reason mines and player death are related is because the mechanic that I use, the code that I wrote, to destroy players with the mines will also destroy all the enemies when I die. So when the player dies, what needs to happen is the player needs to be sent back to the center of the screen, and all the enemies on the screen need to be destroyed, so you're in a safe starting position to start playing again. And Ed, uh, Ed before you before you go on, is this, this mine that you're talking about? I don't think I'm seeing this on the screen. Is this uh, is it something one of the elements that's on the screen, or is it, I know on the mobile version there's like a button that you can push. Right. Let me go ahead and start the game back up into the play mode, and I'll pause it so you can see what's going on. Two seconds. Let's get some enemies on the screen, and then I'll oh. I'll pause. There it is. Whew. I got too many windows going on. I'm probably killing the recording. Okay. So I'm running this in the simulator. And when you run this in the simulator, uh, the things that you're going to have on the screen are the score counter on the upper left, a HUD at the top that shows you how many lives you have left, the little ships that look like me, sort of. And then these little star things are supposed to represent how many mines I have. Uh, also on the screen, also on the screen is a back button. Uh, which only shows up in, should only show up in the simulator, but in, when you make this for desktop mode, this will be gone because you're going to be using your controller. And then if you build this and install it on an Android device or an Apple device, the screen will look a little different. You'll have 
two virtual joysticks, one on either side. And then down here, there will be a button because you don't have a controller. Now you're using a mobile device. You need a button to use your mind. So I just put a button on the screen. It's not very fancy. So that's what you were talking about. But today, when I said minds and indicators, what I meant was is this little indicator at the top, it shows that I have three minds. So now I'm going to push my controller, and that should have used one. Oh, there. So let's get some guys on the screen. And then on the controller, I'm going to push button A. And it used up one of my minds, destroyed the guys, and I got some points. So um, as I was saying, these two mechanics are tied together in the sense that I want to use the same code to destroy the enemies uh, when I use a mine as when I die, when the player dies, and I need to go back to the center and clear the screen. So let me bring up the code, and we'll take a look at how this works. Now, uh, I'm doing something a little different, as our final episode here is all different on this particular game, final episode, um, in that uh, we said this in our prior recording, but one of the things that's difficult for me to do sometimes is kind of just like remember where I'm at, long episodes are difficult, and so it's we talked about fresh content. But one of the challenges I always have when we start up these shows is saying, okay, these are the things I want to talk about. These are the different pieces of code I need to look at so people look at the right places. So I'm going to take you on my typical journey of how I find stuff that I'm talking about. Now, first of all, because we're, we're doing this demo and uh, I don't want to have to be constantly trying to evade enemies while I'm talking, there is a feature in the game in common Lua that allows me to change the speed of the enemies. They can keep moving, but they'll move very slowly. That way I don't have to constantly be chased. I mean, I'm being chased, but I can easily get away. So if you look in common Lua and you zoom down or you scroll down, you'll find a section called enemies. And in here is a debug flag called enemy debug speed, which is normally commented out but if you uncomment it then you can set it to any value you want that's greater than zero in fact you can probably make it zero but i'll make it one and then if i rerun the game and i play you'll see that the enemies pop into the screen they are just really not moving i mean they're moving but it's clearly the glacial so I don't have any issues now. I can talk and talk and talk and not die, and everybody gets what they want. So we're going to talk about mines. I'm just going to leave that running for now. And the next thing is, is um, I left myself some notes, so I'll start there. Uh, I know that uh, this is Hangout 180, right, Charles? It's not 181? No, nope, 180. Okay, so we're in okay. Hangout 180. I put some notes in here last time around, knowing that I'd come back to it. So uh, one of the first things I'll do is say, all right, Hangout 180, I'll find a file. I know that the HUDs track mines, so I'm in there. And then I believe I said uh, last week, let me find it. I have another tool here that I use. Let me just go ahead and bring it up. We'll do this a little bit live. Where are you, loco? I got, this is my, maybe I should do this off. Here it is. We'll just search for mines. Actually, you know what it was? It was there was a there was a string purge enemies because that's the event that gets rid of all the enemies on the screen. So if I search for purge, should hopefully this is where you get to see me stumble. Purge, purge enemies. Ah, yes, I can't type. So purge and uh, good enough. All right, so I searched through all of these scripts in the project, and there are three files that involve the event purge enemy. So today we're talking about minds and player death, both of which use an action called purge enemies. And purge enemies' job is to remove the enemies from the screen. Additionally, depending on whether or not we've used a mine or we the player just died, when we're purging, if we used a mine, we get points. If the player died, we remove the enemies, but we don't get any points. So let me go ahead and just clear off everything except for let's just close some of these windows here and then i'll drag the three in that are involved and let's go ahead and search for purge enemies so let's start in huds i'll make this a little bigger so you can see it 
So in HUDs, let's see, da, 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 purge enemies. Okay, so what I did was, if we take a look at the game again just briefly, whew, getting a little bit out of control there. Let's start her up and pause it. That way I don't have to do anything special. We've got the HUD at the top. The HUD here currently tracks how many, um, how many mines we've got. Now, mine tracking starts in common Lua. There is a section here in the player section that tells you how many lives and how many mines you start off with, which is then used in the HUDs code. And you'll see in the HUDs code that there is a lives counter and there is a mines HUD. Now the way I wrote this code is sort of, it seems like a little bit goofy, but you're always stuck with this chicken or egg kind of scenario. You've got an element in your game, for example, mines, and you want to be able to keep track of how many you have, and decide when you're allowed to use them or not use them. So in this case, I can use them or not use them based on how many I have left. If I have no mines in my inventory, clearly I can't use a mine, I'm stuck. So where do I keep track of that? What I decided to do was keep a counter in common Lua called current lives and current minds, and the current minds for this discussion, and then create a piece of code for the HUD that does the following. What it does is, is I created the image, and then right below it here, I attach, let me make it really big so you can read it, I attach an enter frame listener. So every frame, the interface will drop into the enter frame listener. It'll check to see if it's a valid um, display object, and if it's not, it will stop listening for enter frame. And then it will see, um, do I have any mines left? Is current, is current mines less than or equal to zero? If it is, that means no mines left. This HUD gets hidden. However, and we talked about this previously on another episode where I talked about that trick for showing um, using a display object and then scaling it. So we're using the scaling technique here. So then I drop in, I've got more than one mine left. So I make sure that the HUD is visible. And then I set the appropriate scale so that it shows one, two, three, four, or five, however many mines that I've currently got. And that is pretty much it. But, at this point in the, the coding, I was thinking, okay, I need to deal with when the user presses a button or creates that event. So I hooked up, and this is, it's, it's kind of bad coding. Maybe I should have put it somewhere else, but this is where it is. So in HUDs, I put another piece of code here that says mine HUD, and it listens for the on button event A. So on button event A is the event that gets thrown when the um, controller is, uh, is the button is pressed on the controller. And so assuming that you get this event, again, we check to see if the mine HUD is valid. If it's not, we do nothing. If we have fewer than or equal to zero mines, do nothing. But if we get this far, we have mines, we've pushed the button, and then what we do is we say, okay, if the user has just pushed the button, so either it's a phase down, or if I translate it into uh, normal events and phase began, I will subtract a mine from my current number of mines, and I will post this event, which is where this whole discussion started. I will post the purge enemies event. And what that is, is the equivalent of a runtime. So post, if you'll recall, is my shorthand notation for, um, what is it, uh, dispatch event which is, would look like this. So let's just do that. I'll show you the equivalent code and just briefly discuss why I prefer this. So this line is equivalent to this line. And as you can see, this line is significantly longer to type. So I've made shorthand notations, which are basically post. And then the first argument is the name of event, the event. So that would be this part right here. And then you can optionally pass in a table with values, and those will get appended just like I did here. I could put more values in. Uh, 
which would be like as if I had done this. And so it gets a little bit out of control. Again, this is much longer to define and I find it much harder to remember. So I made shorthand notation. We've dropped in, we've pressed the button, we have a mine. I'm going to dispatch an event or post an event called purge enemies. And we'll get rid of the Bob's your uncle nonsense. And I will also set a flag on this event called get points. And what that means is, is I want you to destroy all the enemies on the screen. And for every enemy that exists, I want you to give me the point equivalent for whatever that enemy is worth. And then... I return false so that if there's any other listeners for the on button event that they can also grab this event and process it and I drop out. And so uh, one thing that you may not have noticed here is, is, as I said, when you drop into this event, we're going to go ahead and subtract the current number of mines. We're going to subtract one, which means that now we have one less. And the next time we come into this inner frame listener we just talked about, it's going to update the HUD just as you would expect. So let's go ahead and start that up and push the button. And next frame, one less mic. Okay, so uh, you're starting out today. You're listening to the show. The first thing you want to do is search for um, the 180 string. And then, or you could skip right ahead and search for, sorry. Search for purge. I've lost my train of thought already. Purge, purge enemies. So, assuming that you've searched for purge enemies, you will find the HUD code, which will lead you to see both how I handled the button press and how I handled displaying. And then we can take a look at the enemy manager and look for the purge enemy code there. And what that's going to take you to is line 146. At line 146, we've, we're in the middle of creating our enemy. And I'm doing things such as attaching the uh, enemy collision handler. I am attaching the self-destruct function. So I created a function. We talked about this previously. But basically, the job of this function is to cleanly destroy the enemy and take it out of the enemy pool so that, um, well, to do those things. And also, I realized when I was making that, that I could simply take the self-destruct code and reuse it. So I created another um, reference on the enemy called purge enemies. And then I simply point it to the self-destruct function. And then I listen for the event purge enemies, passing in enemy. And then the code will say, what the corona does is says, okay, you want me to listen for this event? On this object, do you have a function by the same name? And because I just attached one right here, I do. So what happens is, is when this event comes in, purge enemies, it will go, Corona will say, ah, there is a function called purge enemies attached to the enemy, but, and then Lua has it pointing to self-destruct. So really what happens is when the purge enemies event comes in, it executes this piece of code, and I basically just searched for self-destruct. It executes the enemy self-destruct code. So huh. you push the button, or the player has hit an enemy, and the purge enemies event has been fired off. Eventually, it trickles down into this function. First thing it does is it checks to see, did I just execute a self-destruct? Now, this is a piece of safety code. That keeps me from having a case where I have a collision with an enemy at the same time I push the button, which could theoretically happen. And then you would get two purge enemy calls, and you don't want to run it twice on the same enemy. So I just put a simple flag on it that said, if I just ran this, don't run it again. And then down at the bottom of the function, I set that to true. So if for some reason it tries to run the function twice on the same enemy, it'll abort. But assuming it gets past this, the next thing I want to check to see is, is the game running? So I check the common variable is running. And I verify that I got an event here. If I didn't, I've given an empty body. And then I look into the event and I check to see if the flag get points is set. 
So you'll recall that when I purge enemies as a result of pushing the button, I set this flag in the HUDs code. So at this point, I'm just checking to see if that's true or it, it exists. And then we do a little bit of extra work here. We call the explosion code. We create an explosion where that enemy exists. And let me just show you what that looks like. So let me go ahead and start this up again. I'm going to push the button. And if you look at this enemy right here, as soon as it destroys, a little explosion occurs. And that's this piece of code right here. It creates an explosion where the enemy is. Next, I check to see, did I set the flag get points? If I did, that is a case where I'm using a mine to destroy enemies. And I post another event. I'm really fond of using events to connect my code instead of calling directly into functions. And I'm just checking over here on the screen to make sure it's not giving me a warning we're gonna run out of time. I'll talk a little bit quicker here. So we get this far, I'm supposed to give points to the player. So I post the on increment score event, which will actually, strangely enough, go back into the HUDs counters. There's another HUD in this file listening for that event. So you can see how with events, it makes it very easy to connect distributed pieces of code without having them all be aware of each other. I have one piece of code over here that posts an event, run some code over here. This one produces another event, which comes back here. Neither of these files has to know about each other. So we increment our score. And the enemies, when they're created, have a, a field called value. You can search for that on your own, but it's going to be in the code above. But basically, at this point, we have created an explosion and destroyed the enemy, or we're about to destroy the enemy, and we've given the player some points. We mark our flag saying that we've run the self-destruct function. Uh, we cancel any transitions that might be on that uh, player because the enemies are using a tran transitions to move around, so we cancel that. We remove the enemy from the enemy tracking table. And finally, we call display remove and destroy that enemy. So, it's a lot of things to grok here, but I got one element left on my screen, and let me just let this run for a little bit, and I got multiple enemies. Now, as soon as I push button A, Every single one of the enemies on the screen is going to run through that signal. So we get the button event comes in. The HUD still had one enemy left, or one mine left, so it was able to execute. It gets further down in the code, and it hosts the purge enemies event. Now, for every enemy on the screen, they each get that event one at a time. They run through that code that we just looked at. They give me some points. They create an explosion. They destroy themselves. Done. Next enemy give me some points, put an explosion on the screen, destroy themselves, done. So all of that happens within one frame, and it's just a, it's a very clean way to handle this. So before I run out of time, there's the other side of purge enemies, which is if I restart the game here, and I let some enemies get on the screen, that's a nice place for one, and then I move around. If I run into this dude, the player is destroyed, and all of the enemies are removed from the screen. So where does that happen? Let me see. Here's the part where I couldn't remember. I could not remember if that happened in the collision handler for the enemy or uh, elsewhere. And I believe that it's in the collision handler for the enemy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into the enemy manager, which is where we create our enemies. And I'm gonna search for the string collision. And as soon as I do that, it's going to take me down into the code and I say, okay, enemy collision. All right, this is where I'm attaching the listener and I've got this function called enemy collision. So let's go ahead and look for that. And then I'm going to look through the code quickly in the code. Okay, uh, is this enemy already destroyed? That means I don't need to run this. Let's get the other object. The other object is whatever the enemy is colliding with. Let's get the phase. Let's extract that from the event. All right, if the phase is not began, in other words, I'm having a collision and I only want to do all my work in the began phase. All right, so if the phase is began, I can drop through here, but if it's anything else, ignore it. Okay, let's assume it is began. All right, here it is. So the code says if other and the collider name for other is player, in other words, I just hit a player. This is the enemy itself saying, I just hit a player. Go ahead and subtract a life from our common counter. So common counter current lives minus one. Um, 
post the on reset difficulty um, event. And just for your edification, what this is, is it's a piece of code living out there. You can search for it. And what it does is it resets the game. So the game gets incrementally harder as the longer you play. This piece of code basically resets the difficulty back to the starting point so that when we come back and we start up again and we're like, we have two lives left, that it slowly ramps up again. And here is what we were looking for. What I couldn't remember, but I, I, I was suspected was, is that the purge enemy call was actually in the collision listener for the enemy. So we're getting ready to destroy the player. So let's go ahead and post purge enemies. And you'll notice that I do not pass in that extra table. In the HUDs here, I passed in a table saying get points is equal to true, which means give me points. But because I'm destroying the enemy, I'm not supposed to get points for the, this is a mistake. I shouldn't get rewarded for running into all the enemies on the screen. So I post purge enemies. I dispatch the event, but I don't tell it to give me any points. So that code that we just looked at, when that runs, it's going to get to the check that says, did you say give me points? It'll be false. It won't exist. It'll skip it. No points. It'll do, it'll do the explosion. It'll remove the enemy from the screen. No points. So the rest of this work is pretty simple. Uh, we wait one frame, which is a trick here. If you do a perform with delay with one, what that really means is wait until the next time slot that you can do work. It's always in the next frame. And move the player back to the center of the screen. And now after you set up that timer, go ahead and call the player self-destruct function to do all the cleanup that it's supposed to do. And we're done. So I went through that really fast, but basically what we did today is we talked about how minds are related to player death. We talked about how the code is distributed. And initially when I came to do this show, I couldn't remember where all the code lives, but I did know that it was related to the event purge enemy. So if you forget everything else I said today, just remember, look at the code, use a tool that lets you search it and search for the word purge enemies. You're gonna find three files, and those files will have all the code is related to using the mine, destroying the enemies, and rewarding the player if you use the mines, but not rewarding the player if you're calling purge enemies as a result of player death. And I think that's pretty much it. I, I'm pretty sure we're going to run out of time here. So you guys have any questions that you wanted to ask me? Uh, everybody's on mute, so you'll have to unmute yourselves. Uh, I don't think they were like, blasted through that. So that was probably like, what, what, what? There you go. I, I just unmuted everybody. Okay. All right. Doesn't mean they'll have questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this has been a heck of an episode. Let me tell you. Is that No, that's good. No, I, I like this. Um, I, I have already experienced the mines button in the mobile version of the game. Um, it was, you know, intuitive. Uh, I didn't think of it as mines, though. That's the one, I think, the one thing. Uh, I, right. thought, I thought of it as just like, I don't know, kill kill all the other things. <laughs> <laughs> kill all the other things. You're right. Uh, and I don't remember. Does anybody remember what they were originally called? I think they did call them mines for some reason in Retro Evolve. But they're not mines in the sense that you leave something and the enemies run into them. Like, that makes more sense to me. A mine is a physical object or a virtual object in the play world that the enemies then run into. Yeah. No. But, it, yeah but, it, but, it, but it makes sense once you've experienced it. You're like, oh, okay, that's yeah. what that button does. The first now, time you press that button, you go, oh, yeah, I need more of that. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's what I was going to ask you now. It seems like as you play the game, you, you gain more and more lives and you gain more and more minds. Uh, yeah. We, we, we went right over that piece of code. So in Common Lua where I said, here's, here's where we keep track of how many lives and minds you have couple lines above that there was a little bit that said every 10,000 points you get a new life or maybe it's a new mine I get these reversed and every 15,000 points you get the other things so I think it's every 15,000 points you get another mine re awarded to you so and that's kind of like the game goes but I don't remember what their point system is and, and right now it seems like it's really easy to play the game live continue to rack up lives and minds so is that something just like you haven't done any any balancing in the game or I haven't done a significant amount of balancing so the balancing the way it works in this game is the game starts fresh 
and you're allowed to have one enemy on the screen. One second later, two enemies. Two seconds later, three enemies. Uh, but actually, it might be power of two. So it might go up one, two, four, eight, sixteen. 16. I think that's actually how it rolls up. Eventually, the, the limit will be a maximum of 100 enemies on the screen at a time. And so the game so, is still winnable and playable with 100 enemies on the screen. So that's as much balancing as I do. Ed, I can't see. I can't hear anything else you said. I've got... Very got distracting with his... Looks like a thing of... He's got like an army of... What are those? Like seals or something? Lego puppies. An army of Lego puppies. <laughs> Wow. So you're talking about everything you're talking about matched exactly with what he was doing there, but <laughs> that was the next feature I was thinking about play balancing with puppies. Yeah, an, an army. But of I chose puppies. not to. That's hilarious. It's a game type. What's that, Barry? That's for the sequel. That's for the sequel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Engage the uh, the puppy and the the cat butt. And the, the cat butt. We show <laughs> shows up in your. Whenever Barry comes on the show, we always get a little cat butt. What's up with that? <laughs> oh man, I tell you what, it has. Uh, yeah, it's been a, a technical. We've had lots of technical issues on today's show, but I'm glad we're here, and I'm glad everybody else was here, and and thanks for going through that piece of. Uh, of the game and uh you know I'm at 32 minutes on my recording which means we can't have very minutes many minutes left in this whole uh, thing here well you, you know what this yeah we, we need to go ahead and wrap it up uh, because we've been here for a while we've been here much longer than whatever everybody's actually watching on the recording so yeah we definitely want to wrap that up um but i did uh i did go ahead and get the pro version of zoom and so which is a monthly thing and so we, we should have unlimited time next time next time yeah so anyway uh so thanks for that thanks for going through that so here's just a short brief recap kind of a tease almost i'll do a, a whole another video for this uh, announcement later on but we're going to be going to a every other week a uh, schedule on corona geek and we're going to be doing uh, a mechanics series each time so we're going to look at something specific in a game so uh, up until this point we've been doing full game series is uh, where we uh, go through the entire process of building a game and have all the menu screens and all the features and all that kind of stuff like that. And Ned's been putting that out for, for people to download. Uh, but we're going to move on from that and we're going to just focus on mechanics, just elements of a game that we, when we look at the game, we're like, how do they do that? And, and not worry about the option screens and the splash screens and all that kind of stuff like that. So, um, so we will be back here on February 29th. So you've got um, two weeks to go back and examine this uh, Geometry Wars Retro Evolved clone and, uh, and then be ready for the next, um, i trying to remember all the words here, mechanics series that we're going to start on February 29th. Make sense? Yep. It's been one of those days, man. It isn't one of those days. It is definitely one of those days. All right, so I'm going to leave it there and, and thank everybody for showing up. Anybody on the panel who wants to hang out just briefly afterwards, that's cool. But thank you for being here. We'll be back here next, oh, well, February 29th, 12 p.m. Uh, to talk all about mobile app development using Corona SDK. Have a great week and happy coding.